Hello, good evening, and welcome back to Broken Oars Podcast. Thank you for sticking with us in this unprecedented period of lack of Broken Oars Podcast, where Lewin is struggling with life, work, professional qualifications, and still being able to pull the same 2K score in his 40s that he could in his 20s and 30s, and I am struggling with life, work, professional qualifications, and not being able to pull the same 2K score that I could. Last year, we asked you if you would like something more about rowing, something about other sports, or something about something else. And you all unequivocally plumped for, we'll take the occasional podcast where you talk about something else. And as a result of that, we did a Sherlock Holmes special based upon me wanting to see if I could actually write a Sherlock Holmes story with all of the stylistic tropes malapropisms, anachronisms, and all of that kind of nonsense in it. It went down surprisingly well, considering that I made it up off the hoof. And since then, we have decided to do another Sherlock Holmes story, but to tie it exclusively to rowing, which is the sport of kings, dukes, archdukes, what else have you got, really? Viscounts? Do we still have such a thing as a viscount? I'm not talking about the biscuit. Uh, um, I have gone into total post-COVID brain fog. I cannot think of any more members of the aristocracy. And to be honest, that's not necessarily a bad thing. We live in an egalitarian age, or we should do at this time in the third decade of the 21st century. And all of those barons and viscounts and dukes and earls, dukes and earls, and or even duke of earl, duke, 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 duke of earl, 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 classic tune. Um, uh, Italian do what band singing about... English history, one of those things. Anyway, shortly after doing the Sherlock Holmes episode, I drafted out an episode that involved Sherlock Holmes, Dr. Watson, and the sport of rowing. Now, because I am slightly didactic, in case you can't tell, I got in touch with the Sherlock Holmes Society and I asked them to check it through and they very kindly did so. And without giving too much away, We are coming up to head of the river and boat race um, times of year. We've had women's head of the river and well done everyone who took part in it. Smashing it down the tideway is something that everyone should do alongside run corn in the rain and various other things that we talk about on this podcast. So the Sherlock Holmes Society got back in touch and said, yes, that's not actually too bad. I got in touch with people like Zoe de Toledo and said, would you mind having a look at this to check for accuracy and a couple of other people connected with Oxford University Boat Club and Cambridge University Boat Club. Now the initial idea was to do one for each boat club, Um, Oxford University Boat Club and Cambridge University Boat Club, a Sherlock Holmes mystery set around the boat race. Um, And we're still going to do that, but Oxford will have to wait for their turn until next year because this one is centred upon Cambridge University Boat Club. I've left a couple of the anachronisms in because Sir Arthur Conan Doyle always did. And in the period leading up between now and the boat race, I will post this unfolding story as we go. The Mystery of the Murdered Bow, Part 1 One of the things I have always struggled with as the amanuensis, or perhaps more accurately biographer of Sherlock Holmes, is not the difficulty posed by our friendship. This, of course, exists. Holmes, as I have stated elsewhere, is the best and wisest of men I have known, and the greatest friend I have had. If I have in some way helped and contributed to his work and standing, then it has been my honour while remaining to his credit. Of course, friends have turned biographer before. Yet one thinks of Forster, penning his life of Dickens, perhaps, and sees the danger in an existing relationship is that one is too close, and despite all attempts to the contrary, the natural human instinct of fellowship can see one endeavouring to present the individual to their best advantage. 
In doing so, one perhaps loses the distance and perspective necessary to see the subject in the round and so present them whole and human. I suppose I feel that I do not struggle with this because I have such little skill with the pen, and also that my detailing of Holmes's triumphs and occasional missteps has taken place as the events chronicled have unfolded. In this light, our virtues and failings both have, I hope, been disclosed as they occurred. And if failings there have been in Holmes's case, I trust that they have only served for his virtues, many as they are, to shine brighter. With regards to accuracy, as a medical man trained to assess the facts of a case before presenting a diagnosis, I can only assert any narrative I have hung about Holmes's work has always been on the bones of a firm skeleton, rather than any whimsical fancies of my own. No, the difficulty as I see it is this. The cases that I have presented represent a fraction of the whole of my friend's body of work. They have been selected at various times for various reasons. Occasionally the demands of modesty and privacy have meant that some cases have not seen the light of day until such time as they would not cause distress or embarrassment to those involved. Others have lain in my archives unheralded, for to publish them would be to touch upon a still live issue of national or even international importance. Many that have been published have been in order to highlight a specific example of my friend's singular brilliance, or illustrate a sequence of events beyond the run of the mill, or even a quirk in our very legal system or way of life. Holmes's work has taken in the highest and the lowest of our common humanity. Indeed, in this capacity, his canon perhaps resents something of a cross-section of our society that may be of some worth when it comes to reckoning our age and all of its graces and foibles at some later date. As with love, crime touches all. However, having been presented to the reading public and generally enjoyed, I feel I know for a fact that my friend's work has generated controversy and interest. Many have presented chronologies of his cases and assessed his professional trajectory and habits despite the established canon only representing a fraction of his exploits. Claims regarding chronology and accuracy have been made. The comments and opinions of others are theirs to offer, of course. I might say that all is as accurate as can be made in a busy and hectic life, much of it lived beyond the pen, as should be the case with all writers. If you do not live, you have little to write about. As for the contrary elements that may accrue over time, I would suggest that all of human lives are studies in contradiction, and in my experience, that is because all of us, intrinsically, are little clouds of contradictions. What is true of us at one time is not necessarily true of us at others. Thus, where an assertion or conclusion is offered at one time in ink, it might well be contradicted or disproved at another by the same pen without lessening the humanity of those involved. In this context, when reviewing notes of some previous cases, I was, however, struck to find that there are very few examples of my friend expressing his talent for deduction in the field of sports and recreation. There was, of course, the celebrated case of the missing wing three-quarter, which Holmes solved with the help of liquid aniseed and a well-trained beagle hound. And there was the striking mystery of Silver Blaze, who went on to win the derby after Holmes's intervention, but very little else. This struck me as odd, given as games and sport are in many ways the defining obsession of our gilded Victorian age. Thousands, if not tens of thousands, from all walks of life, flock to watch and play cricket and rugby and association football. Horse racing continues to attract the attentions of high and low. The prize ring is no longer the preserve of pugs and gentlemen, with boys learning to box in most schools. And there is indeed no finer exercise for the temper or the muscles of the legs and back. And that is before we reach the worthy games such as tennis, croquet, squash, rounders and those that have continued with us through the ages, like archery, shooting, athletics and the quirks of the sporting wager contest, where a man might swim from Hammersmith to Waterloo against a Newfoundland dog for £50 and both drown. All of these sports are carried by newspapers. Some play, all are interested. Except for my friend Holmes. As I have said elsewhere... He is indeed a fine boxer and a more than capable fencer and single stick man, and is capable, when consumed by the case in front of him, of more muscular exertion and endurance than perhaps any other man I have ever met of his height and weight. I have heard him speak, moreover, of the nobility of the amateur sporting tradition. But sport in and of itself is not for him. 
He has shown little interest in attending a cricket match when I have invited him, for example, or in taking in a contest at Blackheath, my old rugby ground. He would rather attend the opera or a recital. And somewhat redress the balance, I offer you a case that I do not think it is unfair to say not only piqued Holmes's interest, touching as it did on the subject of murder, but also helped to preserve one of our country's noblest institutions, the annual Oxford and Cambridge boat race. I am, of course, referring to the mystery of the murdered bow. Sherlock Holmes, The Mystery of the Murdered Bow, Part 2 It began in the second week of March in the year 1886. Our friendship and working relationship was some five years deep at that point, and Holmes and I had slipped, if not into routine, for while crime can become mundane, it is always shocking, then certainly into the pattern that extended living and working together brings to all. It had been a hard, dark winter. We had suffered a decade or more of them in Britain at the time, with the weather often being unusually cold and yet unusually sunny between November and February. This had seen the Serpentine, among others, freezing over, and crowds of up to 50,000 had attended skating festivals, enjoying the fun. We had seen little of this. It had seemed like an endless procession of long, cold nights, short, bleak days, each revealing a window into the depravity the human animal is capable of wreaking on its fellows. Case had followed case, murder and worse, common burglaries, forgeries and frauds, attempted kidnappings and shanghaiings. We had followed scents from Belgravia to the rookeries of St Giles and back, and by the time February began to slip into March, we were sick of it. Tell you, Watson, began Holmes one morning, throwing his paper down as breakfast was served. The common theory is that crime goes up as the temperature rises. As the blood heats, so too does the temper, and with that come the flashpoints that are the hallmark of the vast majority of crimes, certainly violent ones. However, I feel when darkness draws a veil over all, as it has done this long and dreary winter, and outdoors is uninviting, the pressure of living without the release of fresh air and sunlight is just as volatile a mix. I don't think I've known a winter like it. I rarely ask for or want to break from work, which is just as well, as crime never sleeps. But I can't help thinking that now we are in March, with the weather turning to spring, perhaps the tide in this will also turn. One can hope so, I replied. It has been a hard winter. Perhaps the hardest of all, replied Holmes, somberly, reaching for his pipe. Do you ever look at our work, Watson, and feel that no matter how hard one works, there will always be crime, which means that our work will never be done? I glanced keenly at my companion. When working, Holmes was prone to focusing on nothing else but the case in hand, often to the detriment of his own mental and physical health, but that was nothing compared to the lassitude and torpor that would overtake him when the flood of cases dried to a trickle and there was little to occupy his prodigious capacities. Then I knew the danger lay in his desire to find other methods of stimulation, and although I had tried to wean him from the cocaine bottle and the morphine solution at these times, I knew that they retained a powerful attraction for him when the drug of work was unavailable. It's a perennial of human nature, Holmes, I said. To err is human, to forgive divine. We cannot forgive, for we are not divine, but the errors and mistakes that humanity makes, we can in our own small way attend to. I believe you've hit the nub of it, my dear Watson. I was, I am afraid, imprecise in my language for once, and... Well, I mean it has been a while since we've seen anything new. Yes, we have seen crime, crime in all of its colours, but there has been nothing to excite my imagination or truly test my skill, for all that we have been busy. There was the case of the whopping wharf steps, I ventured. Oh. Holmes sighed. Simple enough for any man who knew the times of the tide on the days of the winter solstice. Even Lestrade could have worked it out. Lestrade didn't. You did, I reminded him. And there was the case of the driverless hackney. Obvious enough, if one knows something of the layout of Deptford. Holmes prowled our apartment, jetting smoke impatiently from his pipe before declaring, I want something that tests me, Watson, something that tells me something about the human condition beyond that it is deplorable and only occasionally redeemed. As he spoke, I caught sight through our windows of a telegram boy making his way across Baker Street, heading unerringly for our door. Well, I said, 
I cannot guarantee it, but there may be something arriving that will fulfil your wishes. If it does not, I suggest we take a brisk turn around London. Fresh air and exercise are for what I recommend for winter blues. It was indeed a telegram for Holmes, from Lestrade. It was terse and to the point. King's College, stop. Young gent, stop. Suicide, stop. Come at once, stop. Tell no one, stop. It was difficult to reconcile the homes of a moment before, a man on the edge of sinking into despair at the thought of no further cases to pursue, with the demon of furious energy who faced me now. He was at the door in an instant. Mrs Hudson, Mrs Hudson, an overnight bag for the good doctor and I. You can spare me a few days from your practice, can't you, my dear Watson? I ventured that I could. My practice was thriving, but beyond the usual crop of colds and sneezes, it was presenting nothing of any great difficulty or matter at the moment. Good, good, said Holmes, turning his back to the telegram boy and slipping him a shilling. He scribbled a note. Quick, send this to Lestrade. He is to touch nothing, you understand? Absolutely nothing. I fancy, Watson, we can make the Liverpool Street train if we dash. It's that or the later one from King's Cross, and you know that in a case like this, time is of the essence. I had read the telegram by this time. Holmes, while it is unfortunate for whoever is involved... It seems simple enough on the outside, does it not? A suicide, no more, no less. There are fifty in London every day. Yes, Watson, I know. But in those fifty, Inspector Lestrade does not call us. Why? Because they are the old, old story. A woman betrayed. Someone who has slipped between life's cracks, failing to hold on. A poor soul for whom living has become too much. Someone driven mad by debt or disgrace. But this... An apparent suicide at one of our oldest and most venerable seats of learning? Lestrade could clear this up in the morning if that was the case. But he doesn't, Watson. He calls. And you know Lestrade. He doesn't call unless he's run up a blind alley or he's onto something beyond his depth. That intrigues me, Watson. It intrigues me deeply. And so we soon found ourselves bundled into a handsome cab, rattling our way to Liverpool Street Station, where only moments before we had been breakfasting and Holmes had been bemoaning the lack of cases before him. We only caught our train by the skin of our teeth, Holmes stopping to buy every fresh edition of the morning papers he could at the newsstand and pausing also to wire ahead to Lestrade to tell him to meet us from the train. All of these delays meant we had to dash as the whistle was sounding and the train was pulling out to make our carriage. "'Nothing,' said Holmes, throwing the papers down as we headed through Broxbourne. "'Nothing in any paper, which means Lestrade has been better than usual at keeping it under his hat. "'But it will leak out, unless we can get there, and get to the bottom of it.' "'I don't see why there should be a scandal,' I said. "'I'm sure there's nothing to it beyond the usual. "'As you said in Baker Street, perhaps the old story, perhaps some, some gambling shame or a woman. "'There's many a young man and a woman come to a cropper in the world when starting out in life.' "'True, Watson.' said Holmes, but you are forgetting two things. Firstly, this is a college of Cambridge, one of our oldest seats of learning. People will stop sending their sons there if they keep killing them off. And secondly, this is Britain. One of the reasons we have such a high suicide rate is because we can't live with the scandals and shames that other countries shrug off. Holmes had travelled widely, I knew, whereas I had only travelled within our Eastern Empire to the extent that my army medical service had allowed. A steamer out east, up to Afghanistan, wounded, recuperation in India, and a steamer home again. But I couldn't help thinking how much fear and shame had featured as driving forces in some of the events previous cases had unfolded, and think that perhaps, again, Holmes might be right. Lestrade was waiting for us as we alighted at Cambridge. In London, Lestrade looked like what he was. Sallow and thin-faced, he was a creature of the streets in Scotland Yard. In the weak sun and breeze of Cambridge... He stood out like a curse in a cathedral. It's a straight suicide for me, Mr Holmes, he said, ushering us to a cab. I've called you in for the look of the thing. The provost of the college has requested that we cover all the angles, and, well, I, I feel that I have to humour him. Holmes smiled thinly at Lestrade's backhanded compliment, but said nothing further as we rattled from the station up Hills Road to Jesus Lane. I knew his methods, whereas a lesser man would have fired off question after question, Holmes was saving all of his powers and his acuity for the moment when he was introduced to the scene. He wished to come to it with no preconceptions. And you'll have to wait for part three. And if anybody from the BBC is listening to this, 
you should really do it with proper actors in time for next year's boat race with the Oxford edition, which I'm currently writing. So, what will Holmes find when he gets there? I don't know, but it has something to do with rowing. Hmm.